the meeting to order at 6.04. Um, can we get the agenda up on the screen, please? Right. Any adjustments to the agenda needed? Uh, uh, the only thing we got is it under action items, the approve the fiscal 1819 audit. Yeah. We're actually going to be approving it, but we will be sharing all the notes at executive session tonight. Okay. So we'll need executive session for that. All right. Um, and we also will have to, I think do a uh, brief update on what's going on with the contract dialogue, I believe, because we had some news today. Yep. So that's not in the minutes. Yeah. In executive session, it does sell, say personnel and procedures. We okay. Have All right. Um, any public comments? Hearing none, I would entertain dialogue regarding the minutes of June 29th June 22nd and June 11th. Are there any any dialogue? I'll make a motion to approve. Approve which one? One or all? All. Is there a second? Second, Sarah. Kathy approved to uh, the minute. Uh, and Sarah seconded for the minutes of June 29th, 2022, 2020, June 22nd, 2020, and June 11th, 2020, as submitted. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So a motion passes, minutes approved as submitted. Uh, reports from folks, who would like to go first? I can. Okay. So um, the process we're looking to do is make certain that you guys with your agendas get written reports that you'll have ahead of time that you can review and then we'll entertain any questions you have about each of our reports. In addition to entertaining questions, I wanted to let you know that uh, Ray and I met with um, Otis. It's the company we use to house our data, uh, student achievement data, and that can generate several uh, reports for us in regards to how students are performing over time most versus, uh, in cohorts and different demographics that we're going to look to better leverage at our data team meetings in the future to make informed decisions around universal instruction or interventions. That will get rolled out during the admin retreat. In addition to we've applied and we're gonna be moving forward with Swiss in order to house our social emotional data across the SU. And both of these platforms will be used to, to make informed decisions both on instruction and supports, as well as to inform the reports that you're gonna get uh, be receiving monthly that was part of your packet for a data calendar. Um, so I just wanted to add that. And then there were questions about when reorganization would occur. Um, the board would be looking to reorganize in August. Jihad has not voted yet and has not reorganized. So therefore, we can't reorganize the SU board until that occurs. Right. I'll entertain any other questions if folks have them. Oh, hey, I see your nipple. <laughs> Hearing none. Anything else, folks? Coming. For Jamie. No. I love you. Uh, Jamie, I just wanted to ask, uh, and I don't know how to approach this. I was watching the news tonight, and I saw one of our principals on. Um, having a, and I just wondered if that was known prior to or if that was something off the cuff. Nope, I was informed about that last week. Okay. John, what was this about? Um, it was about kids going back to school. Uh -huh. And I didn't know that the white, that we had done any formulations of that to put out. So I just wondered where that came from. That's all. Got it. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily representing White River School. It that, was more about educators in general. 
is how I was. It had, it had his name and affiliation underneath on the yeah, cabinet. I was aware that that might occur. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Who'd like to go next? This go down. Is here. Is Tara on? I'm sorry? Yes, I'm here. All right. I'm just, I don't have anything with me. I'm in the car. <laughs> so I emailed you all my reports yesterday um, to look at. And then in the executive session, we'll discuss the FY19 management letter. So if there's any questions on any of the other stuff in my report, I can answer, try and answer those. And I also wanted to share that Bill applied for an $8,000 grant for the summer food service program. And he was awarded that. We found that out late Friday. So that's right. going to help with the summer food service program. Nice. Anything else for Tara? No, hearing none. Um, Who'd like to go? Don? Yeah. You want to? So, so uh, yeah. Um, with your brilliance. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try. Um, right. Just uh, settling into my office a little bit, uh, finding, uh, as my report says, uh, meeting people, building those relationships, uh, and, uh, you know, role, finding out roles and responsibilities within our team, uh, reaching out to uh, our, uh, you know, supporting um, agencies like Claire Martin and so forth. So, um, again, we're, we're uh, you know, it's a work in progress. You know, so uh, looking at the budgets, looking at caseloads, uh, trying to analyze uh, where we're at, and hopefully in next meeting I'll have some uh, some more figures and numbers for you where I think we should go. Do you think that's that's a, a doable doable time frame? Do you think we can get something next meeting or? Well, I'll, I'll give I'll, I'll give you what I have. Okay. You know? And right. as we move forward, so it might not be a polished and finished product, but um, I'll keep you posted where I'm at. All right. Terrific. Any questions for Don? Is anybody out there? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I can see you all. Um, Mary Ellen, do you want to step up to the plate? Yes. So um, in my report, I it's quite detailed, but um, I've been working with Charlie Watson and Amy Toth on the coaching and the detail of what's going to happen next year in our work with teachers to help them provide instructional practices that can be used both in the classroom and online if we need to transition um, back and forth. And um, Amy Toth is on the line. Amy, do you want to just add something there? I'm, I'm just really excited about um, the work going forward and um, we're pulling in a few new groups in more of a systematic way, including pre-K as well as interventionists. Um, and Jamie's indicated um, some additional work with principals um, also. So um, I fleshed out those uh, sequences um, this last week and I'm really excited about um, how we'll be in implementing uh, some of the phonics and word study in the coming year, as well as firming up um, our work from last year. So those are the highlights for the curriculum instruction and assessment area. We um, are working on assessment plan, which will develop all our data points, as Jamie was pointing out, so that we can report out through the year. There's more in there. If you want to take a chance and read it all, that's fine. And I'll answer any questions anybody has. Has anybody had a chance to review it and then formulate questions at this point? Uh, Mary Ellen will review it and digest it and review. Okay, thank you. Cynthia, do we have a lot of money coming? Well, I sent you a report which said that we were uh, awarded $737,000. It's a little bit higher than it was l last year, but um, it had to be distributed differently because the free and reduced lunch uh, numbers changed. And um, we are spending... Um, 
included in our initiatives are the for the grant is uh, salaries for the grant administrator, pre-K interventionist, part of the pre-K coordinator salary, the parent and family engagement, and homeless liaison instructional coach, and part of the li literacy coach, and every all the other stuff went to the schools. Uh, that, that's all I really have to say. And I um, also, we also got the uh, best grant and we're out for the, uh, we're waiting to hear on the tobacco grant, which is about $30,000. So the best grant is gonna pay for the Swiss uh, software to go into the schools that don't have it. So that we'll have a consistent way to um, measure referrals and, uh, and the behavioral issues. So that's all I've got. Okay. Yeah, that, that tobacco grant has really diminished over time for some reason. I don't know why, but um, okay. Anything, any questions for Cynthia regarding grant funding and dispersion? No? I don't have the list for the agenda up. Who's next? Anybody? Okay. Technology. Technology, Ray? Thank you. So uh, you have my report. And I would just like to highlight that uh, devices came back mostly in good shape. Devices, uh, damage was at a manageable level. Devices have been ordered for the fall in the amounts that we think are appropriate. We're reviewing uh, what we use to send alert phone calls, emails, and texts, try to streamline that for better communication. And what was the other thing I talked about? Ah, uh, consolidating services has saved us a little bit of money, and we'll look to uh, do that again in the fall for budget season in next year. Thank you. Nice. Any questions for Ray? Well, hearing none, we're, we're moving right along. Can you post that agenda again? Yep. Please? We're on to negotiations, Don. Negotiations, okay, do we? I just wanted to put out that date, and I think we've confirmed that we'll meet as a committee on July 20th at 6. You want it on the 20th or the 17th? You want it on Monday, whatever. On a Monday, right? Monday, Monday is preferable for most of us, I think. Isn't that the 20th? I don't, I don't yes. know. Yes. Okay, yeah, that'd be fine. Whatever. Okay. All right. That's good for me. All right, so Monday the 20th at 6, I'll get that out tomorrow. And then okay. as far as policy committee goes, I was well, hoping I, to pull that committee together on the 27th at six. I, 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 as far as the uh, the dialogues regarding the contracts, I think we might as well let everybody know that the teachers came back with a counter proposal. So I, that doesn't jive with what we had sent them. So we're gonna have to set back and figure out where we go from here, folks. So just more to come, in case anybody was wondering. All right. Sorry, Jamie. No, you're fine. I'm just looking to, there's been some desire to get back to work on policies. Oh, who, who wants to do that? I just heard a few people might be interested. Um, I don't think that's everybody's favorite. And, you know, there was some talk, at least at the RUD level, and that's why I want to pull the policy committee together, about the idea of an equity policy. And so I wanted to pull the policy committee together to discuss that. And there's some other business in regards to grants and things that we need to tidy up and revise. So I was looking to pull that together that committee on the 27th at 6. I think we did have some unfinished business anyway. I recall some that were sent back that Dina needed some pretty significant revisions. That's true. There were three. Yeah. Okay. So the 27th. That works. All right. We'll get that out. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. Discussion items. What's going on with the COVID-19 update? With the so the 
committee met on Thursday. Um, all the subcommittees uh, provided their last final draft. The committee reviewed it. I'm supposed to be receiving it this week, formatted. And I've got a meeting with Bonnie Bourne. She facilitated the group um, tomorrow to review those documents. I've been reviewing them as they, we've gone. My plan was to issue that document in full on Thursday. Late, late last week, there was information that came out from the agency that they might provide an additional update this week of revised, gu revised guidelines. I'm trying to gather whether or not those are small revisions or large revisions. So I put a probe out um, in regards to, at the AOE and the VSA to find out if folks have any information around that. If they're small, my plan is to still release the task force guidelines. If it looks like it could be something large, then I'm gonna hold off and my bi-weekly communication will be this week to explain why that is. Um, so my hope is to have a document out this week um, that provides the schools with the guidelines and recommendations around how they can look to move forward and implement in-person instruction at the building level. I, we have a COVID-19 uh, now uh, tab on the SU page where folks can submit questions and I'm answering them every two weeks. One of the larger questions we have, and I think what the agency is wrestling with that we've asked for greater clarity around is what constitutes an immediate medical risk that then we would look to be able to provide virtual learning um, to an elementary student due to that risk. That's the guidance we haven't received yet um, in a clear way. At the middle high school level, there's a little bit more of um, an ability to maneuver around the idea of personalized learning and pathways that can better allow us to provide a hybrid model that we don't have the ability to do at the elementary school right now. And so we're taking those things case by case basis. Principals have been uh, working with me to make certain that I'm in the loop at times when it's appropriate, Don's been part of those conversations. And, um, you know, we're moving forward with the concept of that we're going to provide 95% of our students in-person instruction per the AOE, and we will provide virtual learning on a case-by-case -case basis if it, that's not appropriate, and that's decided by a school team. It's, it's important for the board to know right now, the AOE stance on this is that it's in-person instruction unless a team decides that virtual learning is appropriate due to a risk. Otherwise, parents have to apply for homeschool. That is the current guidelines, and they have until August 1st to do that. And so I'm waiting on further guidance, and then I will wait until the last minute to get my letter out on Friday with that guidance and with the COVID task force recommendations. Um, Jamie can... And Don, this is Lisa. I'm wondering if I can jump in and ask a question, or should yeah, um, I'm Tori, wondering. I already did. Please. Okay. Um, I've been hearing that in districts where they've pulled their families, they've learned that somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of families don't feel comfortable returning their students for in-person instruction. So my concern is that if we were to find out that the numbers were that high, if we're not prepared to be flexible, that our ADM will be impacted ex in extremely negative ways that will hamstring the resources for all other students. Um, so tonight um, on the news, I heard the su superintendent of the Burlington District indicating that they are planning to be more flexible than what the state guidance is because the AOE has sort of backpedaled a little bit from what I've heard um, and is now saying that that's guidance as opposed to mandate. Um, so I'm just wondering what your thinking is. I mean, I feel like you just shared what your thinking is around this. I'm just incredibly concerned about our ADM if we have a large number of families applying for homeschooling or in some cases, families with resources applying to online um, private academies 
or in some instances, CCV has announced that they're doing all online instruction this year. So our seniors would be able to access early college. They've also pushed their application deadlines back. Um, so it just all makes me very nervous for our district. I think we can be as flexible as we possibly can in the middle high school levels. And so Lisa, I under, he's a brand new superintendent as well. And so I'm not certain what guidance he got to think that he could be that flexible, but that's not the information I've received through the Winooski Valley Superintendents Association. I'm not saying he hasn't, but what I need to make certain is that we can count those students if they're virtual. And right now the guidance I've received is that at the elementary level without a pathway, that students need to be in-person instruction in order to count toward ADM unless a team is determined that it's appropriate on a case-by-case -case basis to have virtual learning in place. Okay. And if that guidance changes this week, then we will adjust. Um, but what I'm not gonna do is, um, I don't think it would be wise for me to put that information out and then we're backtracking it. Mm -hmm. I have a question too, Sarah. Yes. Um, I'm wondering what kind of considerations and and considerations and and opportunities we're also thinking of for um, uh, health compromised um, employees. I'm working with legal and the VSA to have an regional approach on that. And once that's determined, then we will issue that. Um. This is Mika Tucker, also from Stratford. Um, I'm wondering what uh, what kind of um, equity assurances we're putting in place to make sure that um, these uh, decisions are made in a way that doesn't, you know, favor the most activated families, um, and uh, you know, doesn't rely on parents to be you know, really savvy and understanding uh, about how to, you know, get what they need. Um, I'm concerned about, you know, our families who may may have needs, but, you know, don't know how to self-advocate to get through the process um, for getting whatever waivers they need to have their kids be out of the classroom. Well, so for right now, Mika, just so I'm clear, it would be medical related. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about whether or not they actually have a legitimate need. I'm worried about how to make sure that all parents yeah. understand the process, have the access, get reviewed in the exact same way um, so that all kids are, are being reviewed for, a, you know, essentially a waiver in the exact same manner across the SU. And so I, that information will continue to be rolled out. Possibly. Okay. It's not going to be a one sh shot. I mean, I think that you're, I mean, these are, I've so far since coming on have put on it out at least four letters due to COVID. And I'll be working with the administrative team to continue to get this message out. The other plan is we, we plan to hold forums across the SU on this once the recommendations come out. So there's a lot of work to be done not a great deal of time. I'm rolling out a calendar with you to provide us some more time. But what I don't want to do is provide information that I have to pull back. Yep. And what I, you know, I don't want to say we can do elementary virtual learning and then we find out we can't because we're going to have a lot of folks upset. And Lisa, your concern about ADM is my concern as well. Stacy had a question. Yes, thanks, Don. Um, I read an analysis that an SU would need roughly $1.2 million a year to justify the extra expenses of extra custodial staff, um, any changes that might be needed to buildings, um, other basic things that are necessary to meet the standards that are set forth in the guidance. And I'm wondering if that's money that we have allocated from the from CARES funding, or if there's, like, I, I don't know if you've done the budgeting work on that. Sarah that attended has. a CARES funding forum this morning that she can jump in on. I had in my note she was going to jump in about that. But before that, at this point, 
by working with my principals, we believe strategically, it's not actually, it's not the cleaning right now I'm as concerned about. I think we're gonna incur some costs there. I will tell you that a major concern of mine is transportation and how I'm gonna handle that and what costs we might um, incur there. So I'm, I'm meeting with a transportation company, Don and I are and Tara on the 28th because that's as soon as I could get them to come to the table of July to discuss how we best maneuver this in the most fiscally responsible way and ensure safety's um, in place. And we've got an ad going up this week for extra subs because we know we're gonna need extra bodies to maneuver things around. And so those things are all happening. Um, you know, if you said to me, Jamie, what are you most fearful about right now is that I don't have the staff or manpower to pull everything off. Um, to, to follow we are that. working with our faculty and staff to, to navigate to what that could mean to our workforce. Okay, thank you. The, I just wanted to follow briefly that the same analysis suggested that we would be soon seeing a shortage of subs uh, because most of them, many of them are coming from retired teacher pools and other um, high risk demographics. And I'm just wondering if, uh, if that corroborates with your experience in RSU. Do our subs skew older, or um, do you think we'll be okay on that? On that, I feel like I can have a better estimate of that once I dig into that. Okay. I mean, that's why we put the ad out. Super. I I'm concerned again about whether or not we will have enough bodies, and part of that is subs. Great, thanks. It's Jamie. certainly one of a few of those extra grays that Don was talking about. I have many. Yeah. Thank you. We talked about that in the in the <clears throat> health and safety uh, subgroup of the COVID task force. Um, and, and with real concern that um, with this increase that you weren't going to get a lot of people saying, yeah, for 90 bucks, sure, let me come into a classroom that's uh, the teacher's out because um, she has COVID or he has COVID and the class has all been uh, exposed to it, that you're not going to get a lot of volunteers. And we suggested that we <clears throat> be preemptive in this and um figure out ways within each school that other teachers could fill in for them and do it before it needs to be done. So that at 8.15, a teacher's not told, not only has she got a kindergarten class, but a third grade class, but she knows that that's a possibility all the time. And, 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 and that it's, it's done beforehand. My experience with um, teachers is they don't mind doing things like that as long as they're not blindsided 15 minutes after you need them. And but that I'll work has already started in some of, uh, Teacher of subs, I, you know, so. Any other input? Tara, can you give an update on the CARES money? I'm going to be putting it. So I had on Friday the VASBO monthly meeting was Brad James presenting the CARES funding and what their thoughts and opinions are and how we can access the money. And it spurred a lot of questions from the seasoned business managers within the organization that there wasn't any real clear guidance as to what we can submit. But the, what they did share is certain, certain portions of the money, if we access it, they will take it from our FY21 funding. So that caused a lot of angst. So what they have done is they have developed a subcommittee within VASBO that's going to work with Brad James and others at the AOE to come up with a streamlined way for all of us business managers to determine what we should and shouldn't be submitting for CARES reimbursement funds. If it was truly an unbudgeted expenditure, we should submit to get that reimbursed from our CFR funds. There's relief fund grouping. If it's something that that's where they're going and we ask for reimbursement, that's where they're going to start taking our money away. So there's a lot of gray area and a lot of uncertainty. So I hope to have more as that develops over the next couple of days as to what we can and cannot do. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm gonna say just so everyone knows, no one that CARES money has not trickled down to anyone. I just think it's important that folks realize that it's not like we're behind the eight ball on this. Okay, Stacey, you had another question. I did. I'm sorry. I'll stop commandeering very soon. No, no. Um, I, I, I um, <laughs> test res COVID test results have started to come in a little bit more slowly. Um, I myself just waited six days for test results negative and um i wanted to know jamie if the department of health is willing to work with um su's or the agency of ed or if there have been conversations started about expediting test results or prioritizing test results for members of our staff um, because keeping everyone out until they get results is just an additional burden on the already strapped resources so that came out in a VSA memo last week, and there wasn't a direct answer about that. That's something that the VSA has raised as a concern. Okay, as long as it's I do be have the annual conference next Tuesday, and I'm hope I'm hopeful there too. The Vermont Superintendents' annual conference is next week, and I'm hopeful that I can gather some more information there, possibly too, on Tuesday. They, COVID is supposed to be on the agenda, of course. Thank you. Um, this is Don, and I just I need to ask a radical, it's probably a pretty radical question, and it's regarding transportation and health. Would it be possible or would it be cumbersome to have the parents drop the kids off at school so they wouldn't have to drive right on a bus? Just a thought, just throwing it out there. One of the uh, questions that the task force analyzed was what percentage of our folks require transportation versus not. Yeah. And one of the things that we, we're gonna be looking to do possibly, um, specifically in our larger districts, is the idea of asking folks um, to consider dropping their children off versus utilizing public transportation. Or, or if there's under under 25, they could do carpool, you know, something like that. So, you know, based on the information I get on July 28th, I could, could be coming back to you with different recommendations in regards to whether or not transportation is makes sense for us or not, based on whether or not I have the manpower to even carry it out. Okay. So, Jamie, I have a question about that. What happens with our contract if... We have a contract with Butler. Yes, what happens? I mean, are we going to pay the money anyway, or are they going to let us out of it? Because that's I got a meeting with them on the twenty eighth. Okay. Yeah. And I would voice concern when we talk about equity. Um, if we're going to decide not to do transportation, there are some families that truly rely on transportation, and maybe they don't have the ties um, to carpool with somebody, and then we're going to have kiddos that can't get to school simply because, I mean. You know, maybe their parents won't drive them or don't drive them or don't have a car. Um, I know there's people in my community that have that problem. So I, I'd be really concerned about those kids. And yeah, I don't think that, I mean, I, I don't know how, how the board feels. I haven't heard that we're not going to try to pursue some level of transportation. I, was just, say, uh, I don't know if we can carry out full transportation potentially. I was just throwing out different scenarios to review. Yeah. And as far as the kids that don't aren't able to transportation, that could be a criteria for homeschool, perhaps. Just throwing it out there too. But. Or we could handle transportation on a case by case basis, the same as we offer remote schooling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was sort of my thought. If we need, if we had to go down that, yeah. that that might be the direction we would go. Yeah. Okay. The issue, I'm working uh, very closely with the Rudd administration around planning around transportation. Just so you know, because we're transporting students across campuses, and that poses a whole other situation um, that the other districts don't ha aren't having to handle right now. Right. All right. Um, anything else regarding the COVID staff situation? Now, do we want to do the finances in um, executive session? Yes. All right. So let's move on to uh, the calendar at this point. Uh, so you have a revised calendar. I've worked with the association and principals on this. I wanted to give you the thoughts of it. Based on all the questions you have, I believe that we need 
uh, more time with the building level staff to ensure we're ready to implement in-person instruction in the fall. And we also know that there's gonna be students that we're gonna need to provide some type of hybrid model to. And that's gonna require time. I was looking to build a calendar that allowed us to have this time up front to make adjustments without, um, you know, changing anything in regards to the number of student days or anything in that regard. So I've moved the SUN service days up is what you'll see instead of them being spread out throughout the school year with the focus of safety and our ability to implement instruction and meet social emotional needs up front. And mm -hmm. so we're looking to have four in-service days at the start of the school year. Students would start on a Friday. You may say, why? Well, I really think it's important that we have a test run and a weekend to adjust. If things don't go right in a building or two, it's gonna be critical that the administrative team can come together and adjust over the weekend. We then would run four, day, four and a half days the following week. That half day Friday prior to Labor Day would again be an opportunity for us to come together in buildings, reflect on what has worked, what has it, and make adjustments. We then would assume uh, our regular schedule on the 8th, the Tuesday after Labor Day. And you'll see what I've done is we, we've moved in-service days that were sprinkled throughout up front because there has been a movement. Uh, again, the superintendents have requested that the number of student days be um, lowered to gain more in-service time. At this point, there's been no movement in that regard. And so I didn't want to wait on this. Some SUs are still waiting. I just said we need to get a calendar out that allows us to let folks plan ahead and that we know we have this time built in. And if they do decrease the student days throughout the year due to a waiver, which would be approved by the legislature in August, I'll take that time and we'll sprinkle it out at appropriate times to either do instructional work or make adjustments throughout the year due to COVID. I mean, I don't believe this is, by the way, I don't want you to think this is the last time I'm pulling you together to say we may need to make an adjustment and add time because I believe that we're going to have to make adjustments based on the information we gather throughout the school year. All right, well, this calendar- Meeting our students' needs. This calendar is constructed with the best efforts and knowledge that we have right now. So that's yep. all we can do. Oh, the um, only other thing I would add, that June 11th last day for FBUD, that's not accurate because Tunbridge Fair is not occurring. You'll see we removed it from the calendar. So the last day for all schools would be on the 10th other than for RTCC. Okay. And I'll get that fixed. Now, weren't we required to have a, an approved calendar sent to the state before before now? We are required to have an approved calendar sent to the state. I spoke to Secretary French last week yep. and let him know I plan to revise it. And he was okay. Yep, he didn't he okay. didn't say right. that, that I couldn't do it. So that was my only concern. So that's the proposal, folks. Is there uh, any dialogue? Is there any motion? Because we need to approve a, a, an amended calendar. I would make a motion to approve an amended calendar. Lisa? Lisa Floyd. Is there a second? A second, Lisa Tucker. It's moved and seconded to approve the um, recommended amendments to the school calendar for 2021. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? You got your amendment. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, guys. And what's next? In-person board, In -person board meetings. meetings. There's been some conversation around that at certain district boards. Um, so what I wanted to offer is, is the concept of if boards wanted to come and socially distance, I believe, based on the number, other than the full SU board, you could have your in-person board meetings here and warn them here. And there's technology that would allow the community to come in virtually that I feel like we can navigate well, just because we're set up and raised here. 
that I'm concerned about if you post it at your at your districts, I won't have that tech person with me. And it could it could be challenging. So I was gonna put out the idea that if the board wanted to come here and socially distance, there's pr there's procedures you have to do as you enter the building, signing in. There's a checklist you have to complete, and you need to wear a face mask. But if folks were comfortable with that, you could come here to attend. And if certain board members are not comfortable with that, that's fine because their virtual option is still right here. And the technology is such that it works fairly well, the audio and everything. So I didn't know how folks were feeling about it. I just wanted to get a sense. Input, folks? Um, my general feeling is that, um, you know, the one thing that's been consistent as the science around this has changed, understanding disclaimer that I am not a scientist, is that what we can do to control the spread of it primarily is to reduce our movement. Um, so, you know, my, my feeling is that people shouldn't be coming from far away to attend or to, you know, to mix and then potentially bring something back into their communities or to give it to you all who are working there every day to send it home to your communities. But um, I feel like that's my opinion as someone coming from Hancock. And if someone feels like they need that, they're not being satisfied by this experience that they need to get around the table together for whatever reason, then that should be up to them. Perhaps as long as you working in the central office are not made uncomfortable by that. I brought that up to Jamie. This is Sarah um, as, a, as one of the people because, um, and one of my thinking thinking is is that if it's not safe for us to get together for a meeting, why in hell is it safe to open up schools? Because it seems two faced and um, just wrong to me. It's, it's we're not walking our talk. And so if it's not safe for us to get together and meet, then let's not let's stop talking about putting schools kids back together in schools with with uh, adults. I agree with that as well. I also, this is Lisa again, I also think that it's worthwhile to get together and as adults see the logistics of what it takes to be six feet apart and what that social distancing actually needs to look like if we're going to do it well. Um, so I think that for people who feel ready to meet in person, that makes sense because I don't think logistically it's as easy um, as we might we might think it is until we do sort of a run through. I also think if we're going to return to in person meetings, that we need to make some agreements about temperatures and masks and those sorts of things when we come together for meetings, um, just to follow the same guidance that businesses are being asked to follow or hospitals. Um, my father's hospitalized. I've been going to Gifford twice a day a week for. Um, a few weeks now, and they take my temperature and make me Purell, and I have to wear a mask every single time. Um, and I just think that that's our due diligence. Other, okay. I think the rules that we have kids and, and schools operate would be the rules that we would operate with, which would be social distancing, washing your hands, Purell, you know, Purell or washing and masks. And I think, I also think the idea of if you're comfortable to go to the office and follow the rules and you can still attend the same meeting virtually, it makes it optional. Like I'm here in the office with the mask on. Um, my internet's not working great. This is on my way home. It makes it much more convenient to stop here and try to get to a six o'clock meeting. Okay. Um, All right. Anything else, folks? Uh, one more. Comment? Come ahead. Comment? Yeah, please. Um, I, I do agree with all that has been said here about, um, you know, if, if we're having trouble meeting in person, how can we expect to open a school? But is that really our choice? Or is it a state mandate that we open our schools at this point? The, my understanding there's no state mandate they're just guidelines is that correct jamie no the, the abm count by the secretary unless he changes that this week and that could be the big announcement folks that's why i said the guidelines haven't come out is that in-person instruction is required huh. right. 
And I do agree that it has been easier to attend these meetings from, you know, my living room. Um, but thanks. Okay. Yeah, I think that's important that we're all clear about that. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the ADM right now attendance is only measured by in person based on the current guidance from the Agency of Education. Okay. Okay. Anything else? So all right, let's move on. Uh, data monitoring report for calendars 2021. Aren't you guys excited about all these sheets I gave you? So this is an effort, and we may adjust this as we go, um, but this is at least the first shot to provide you all with a data calendar for you to hold progress monitor our SU goals. I said in my board report, we're going to be taking the strategic plan, revising it, coming to you with three overarching goals for your adoption, and then the SU will create tasks based on the three goals because the strategic plan is running out. There's lots of tasks in the strategic plan that haven't been accomplished yet that will move in to this new document. The idea too is that this new document will really be our continuous improvement plan, which the agency of ed uses for our federal funds because we want our title funds to drive the work within that document. They shouldn't be separate. This is a uh, attempt to have data reports to you monthly that you'll get across the districts or at the SU level to progress and monitor our work and whether or not we're being effective at meeting those goals. So in September, you'll get a social emotional data report at each local district level on office discipline referrals. Those will be broken down for the previous year and your attendance data. And then principals will, will address to you at that evening, what tasks they plan to put in place to address their concerns based on that data analysis. And then you'll get another one of those reports later in the year so that you can start to progress and monitor the results of their efforts. Same with STAR 360. When you look at WRBSU in November, I'm, looking, I'm gonna be looking for Don to do a child count overview for you so you understand special education data and what our child count is and what we're doing to try to make certain we're getting interventions and supports earlier because the idea would be if our MTSS is working our referrals would decrease for special education and we would better meet students needs at a quicker uh, more responsive time um, you're going to hear me say over and over again Special education, as it's set up with adverse effect in Vermont, really is a failure model. You have to fail and be behind one and a half to two grade levels or in the bottom 15th percentile before you're going to qualify. That's really hard then to fill that gap. And so one of the, and we'll talk to you in each month, the data points that you should be looking at in order for you to gauge whether or not our work's effective. Um, so what I'm looking for us to do is become a system that's analytical and that we're using data points to then make informed decisions about next steps. I'm also going to be looking for us to use those data points in regards to how we build budgets. Um, next month, you're going to get a calendar for how we're going to look to uh, approach budgeting for the upcoming school year. And um, one of those suggestions that I'll have for you is that we actually scrap our current budgets and that we look to build from the bottom up based on the goals we define. Because I think if we can approach it that way, that we could potentially find significant efficiencies that we haven't quite realized. And whatever we're budgeting needs to support the goals and improvement of this data. Those are the questions you should, I'm hoping that you ask us and hold us accountable to. So if anything, I look at this as a progress monitoring tool to make certain that you're holding us accountable to meeting your ends. Okay, there was a couple of months there, January and February, we should already have a budget put to bed so that because we need to get them to the printers and everything for town meeting. So I'm not sure what can be put in there 
in, in, in place of that. Yeah, maybe I was looking for recovery from data from but no. Okay. <laughs> no, I okay. could probably go back to the admin team around February um, and uh, see what we want to add there as a data point. Okay. All right. Anything else, folks, for any feedback? All right, let's move on. Does this sound good for folks? Is this helpful? And if you have data that you've been wanting to see, if you email it to me, let me know, and then I can I can dive into that with the admin team and figure out what makes the best sense for that report. Okay. Um, I have a question. This is Mika um, from Stratford. Um, you know, one of the challenges uh, that we did a we did a survey um, a year and a half ago on something you know completely unrelated, but um, you know one of the feedback points that we got from data scientists and sociologists was you know your populations are so small it's very hard to analyze um, and and really get that much out of this data other than yep you got you know here's a positive data point or a negative data point. Um, uh, you know, it's just very difficult given the very small population that you have. Um, what sort of guidance are we getting, you know, to better understand um, these data points as more than sort of anecdotal, um, you know, in terms of just our, our very small population in the SU? So, Mika, I think that one of the ways we should be looking to utilize data is cohort growth and rate of growth over time. Because even with a smaller population, we're still gonna see cohort growth throughout this school year and over the years to come. Um, whether it's a cohort of 10 or whether it's a cohort of 40. Um, and Amy's saying she agrees. So I'm looking at cohort growth. I also am looking at equity. I think one of the areas that we need to dig into is performance of gender. Um, and we also need to look at performance of our free and reduced lunch and students who are living in poverty. So those are the type of data points that I want us to dig into. And when it makes more sense, we'll report it out at the SU level because we have plenty of students at the SU level that we can report out on. Yeah, that, so at that's... the district level, cohort growth makes sense. Okay, yeah, that, that helps to know that, that sometimes we'll aggregate at the SU. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Anything else regarding data gathering? Okay. Let's move on. What's the, what's the next one, folks? Uh, oh, the Chromebooks. Done. Okay. Um, I, I, I asked to put that on there. It's another, another attempt to try and get everybody playing on the same page. Um, I know everybody online has their own computers and everything, but I didn't know if there was a desire or a need for um, a, a supply of books from the SU, a Chromebooks from the SU. So that's, that's, and we could theoretically, I think, use some of that COVID-19 money in order to supply that, but I'm not positive about that. Does anybody have a desire for that? You're meaning getting computers for us board members? Correct. I don't need any more computers. Thanks. <laughs> I feel like ownership, I mean, back to the issue of equity, I feel like owning a computer shouldn't be a barrier to serving on a school board. Um, so certainly if someone is in, and I don't know how to communicate that to people who might be interested, but otherwise feel like they can't serve on the board. Um, so I would not be, I would not object to issuing them on an as needed basis. Yeah, okay. I think on a need basis would be a good solution, Don. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Kathy. I said, I think on a need basis would be a really yep. good solution. Okay. Well. If everybody's okay with that, then we'll, uh, if anybody knows of any board members that um, are having 
And I don't even know if we could drill down and maybe offer internet service at the house. I mean, we're doing that for students. Why couldn't we do that for school boards if somebody needed it? Jamie, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you'd if like, I can get Christy, I can put together a little survey. We can send it out and folks could fill out a form if they're in need. I can collect the data that way and then move forward. Okay. Is that agreeable to folks? I see a collective nods and thumbs up. So let's do that. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. And we'll get off this topic. That mentioned it at elections. Right, well, who, what's next, folks? The draft audit management letter and corrective action plan. We're going to move that to executive session. Okay. Uh, board signatures on warrants. That was in my board report. Just a reminder that it is extremely, extremely important that you sign your warrants in a timely manner. The treasurers cannot send out checks until they have your signatures. And our office and your treasurers are the ones that get the nasty phone calls from the vendors wanting to know where their money is. And we have to explain to them that we don't have signed warrants, so we can't release the funds. It's just my friend, annual friendly reminder. And, and I would also like to add, if folks need a tutorial on signing it electronically, that might be arranged too, just to ease, ease things. Sign what electronic? The ones. Tara, do you let uh, the individual boards know if they're having that problem? Yes, I reach out. Joe lets me know if she's not getting signed warrants and then I get involved. Okay, thanks. Anything else for the warrant issues? Hearing none, central office health insurance. So that is just a heads up for future planning when we're discussing, I outlined that in my business manager's report. Not really much more to talk about there. Unless anyone had questions. Anyone? All right. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, food service. So I just wanted to let you all know that we have been wonderfully selected again for our summer food service program. We'll be going through audit again from the child nutrition program. It's just because the food's so good, they want to come back and have some more. So they're doing it all by desk audit. So Bill has been working so diligently he sent me a picture of the pile, which was already at six inches thick of the material and documentation that we had to get together to submit to them. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. Keep us updated if you would. Absolutely. All right, let's uh, circle back up. Is there a motion to go in executive session to discuss? So moved. Okay. All right, we're out of executive session at 714. Is there a motion to enter executive session to discuss contracts? So moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded to enter executive uh, dialogue for contracts. All in favor say aye. 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 We'll go into at 714. Ray, this is so much easier when you join us for executive session. <laughs> It's uh, we're confirmed next meeting dates and then future agenda items. And I had a few, a few future agenda items that I wanted to bring up to the board. Okay. So we have an executive board scheduled, of course, because it's every other month is my understanding for Monday, August 24th. My question is whether or not we want to have an executive board and then piggyback that on a full reorganization reorganize and then go to executive. What are folks' thoughts around that? My thoughts is if we're all there for a full board, why don't we just continue and have a full board meeting? I'm fine with that too. Just reorganize and then we just push off the executive. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. That, I just didn't, I wanted to make certain. Yeah, that way we're not duplicating efforts. That works for me too. Okay. So it'll be full board on the 24th. Future agenda items. Um, one will be fiscal outlook. 
I have a haircut, I know, but what, what do you mean physical outlook? <laughs> so we're going to give you an, an update on the fiscal outlook of the organization. Oh, and fiscal. talk to you about ideas and plans of how to move forward um, to ensure that we're on stable ground. And that would then lead into our budget calendar that I'll have for your review. Of course, COVID will be a hot topic in August. Yeah. Anything else that folks would like on the SU agenda moving forward? Food service is one for me that I'd like to bring back up to you guys. We've had some changes in personnel and as well as just the agency's um, desire for us to become more centralized around food service. That's clear to me. And so that's something I'd like us to discuss in the future. It doesn't have to be in August, but just to get on there as a placeholder. Jamie, is, I mean, is, do you see your your report as sort of a, a state of the SU? Or It'll be a state of the SU in addition to after we have those goals that I roll out to you guys, it'll be a state of the SU in through the lens of those areas. Okay. Uh, which it looks like based on your strategic plan is gonna be like MTSS, personalized and proficiency-based learning, and really community connection and interdependence across the SU. How are we doing a better job? And I think equity falls in that and things of that nature. So I'm seeing that those are gonna probably end up being something like the three main major goals as we dig into the strategic plan in the work ahead. Um, those things were sort of captured with, throughout the strategic plan and the task aligned to it. Um, one of the things that I've spoken to Mary Ellen about and to the principals is that we are not down the road in proficiency-based learning as far as we need to be. And nor are I think, uh, do I think we're leveraging that enough to best meet students' needs, uh, specifically at the middle high school level. And so that's that's certainly something that you're going to hear me talk about and report on next steps. And Rudd, you'll be hearing about that um, at length as we move forward. And all those things impact things like special education and things of that nature and alternative placements. Oh, I did mm -hmm. you see me yesterday? Okay. Uh, did you see me Any other topics, yesterday? folks? If you think of anything, please email uh, Jamie and myself and we'll get them on. Jamie, does the SU have copies of the strategic plan in case we have board members that don't have it? Yeah, but it's right on the website. Oh, okay. Um, but I can definitely ask Christy to email it back out to everyone. And again, we're gonna need to update it, but. Sure. Okay. Ray's putting it in the, uh, link right now, but I can also ask Christy to get it out if that's helpful for folks. I think all the Stratford board has it, but, or at least, I don't know if our new people do, but. Um, I also don't want to confuse folks right now. I mean, I could say that, I'll make certain to say that this is the current strategic plan on the books, but that we're at a place of revision. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, folks? Motion to adjourn. Sarah, any, is there a second? Do we have to? Oh, we're out of session. Yes, second, second. Let's get out of here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> wow, let's put the cut before the horse here. Yeah, okay, we moved the second. Did all in favor? Say see you bye. See you bye. Thank you, see folks. You bye.